Again, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, and the title of the message is To Take Courage in the Lord. See if you know any of these interesting, I think, facts about Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple being the first temple uh, that was constructed. Well, it was built over a period of seven years, Solomon's temple was. Do you know where they imported the wood from to build it? Lebanon. Uh, That's interesting. Uh, We might not typically think that. The dimensions were approximately 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. That's a pretty big uh, construction of a temple there. Quite uh, more elaborate than the tabernacle for sure. I ran across this as well, that someone once tried to estimate based on materials and labor costs today that it would be well in the millions what was spent. So quite an elaborate, of course, construction there, the first temple otherwise known as Solomon's Temple. Now, I figure some of you are saying, what in the world does this have to do with today's message because Solomon's long gone? Well, what it has to do with it is the second temple, which is what is being encouraged to finish building here was simply nowhere as elaborate as Solomon's temple. It paled in comparison to the grandeur of Solomon's temple. But as the Lord often does, and he does in particular in the minor prophet Haggai, is that the Lord is going to encourage the people to keep building and to finish the work that he's giving them For many reasons, one is no work we ever do for the Lord is insignificant. We may think it is compared to something else, but there's no work we ever do that is ever insignificant for the Lord, no matter how small we think it is. But the other is the Lord says, I'm going to be with you. You don't need to fear. I will be with you until you finish the construction of what I have purposed you to do. And so this morning we're going to look at another message meaning there's four in Haggai that the prophet gives. This one in particular is going to encourage those folks that were there and saw Solomon's temple in all of its glory. But then when they began to see the rebuilding of the second temple, as we'll see, they are very sorrowful in light of what that temple looks like. More on that later. If you want to follow along, the outline is on the back of the bulletin, and it's the same as on the screen there. There we will look at verses 1 through 2, the setting of the second message. On the surface, it will seem like, okay, well, we calculate the date and we move on, but there is actually significance to this date, and I'll give you the two main reasons in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. And then in verses 3 through 5, the Lord is going to tell them to take courage in Him. In other words, take courage in the Lord, as He often does. But then finally, in verses 6 through 10, you get a brief glimpse of what will entail the final message, which is the prophetic piece, which is there's hope for the future. They won't actually see it in their lifetime, but there's hope in the work that they're doing that will be fulfilled one day in the future. Uh, And this plays into the prophetic piece of the book. Uh, In particular, we'll see this in the last message we have. So let's read verses 1 through 9 of chapter 2 of the prophet Haggai, and then we will look at trying to understand how he encouraged, uh, but more importantly, perhaps, why he did so. Because the people are quite discouraged, a group of them would be, and it has to do with Solomon's temple. But let's just read verses 1 through 9 before we look at it. So chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? How do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And all you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. 
As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also in the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with wealth, with the wealth of all the nations, and I will fill this house with glory, declares the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The, glo- the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give you peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Now as we begin looking at this, it's helpful to just sort of get a basics of where we are. The prophet Haggai is two chapters, so it's short, but it's four messages. In other words, it's four sermons. In a sense, that would be the equivalent of what we might think of. It's four recorded sermons that were given over the course of August through December of 520 B.C., We have covered the first one, which I took and divided into two parts, which was a call to finish the temple. Now we are in this promise of future glory, and that's the verses 1 through 9 there. Now, I use this, and uh, hopefully it's helpful if you need to try to figure out where we are in history, in other words, with the Bible. So the Jews were sent into exile for disobedience, but just as they were sent into it by the promise of the Lord, they returned because the Lord promised that once they had served that judgment, in other words, 70 years, he would bring them back. And what do you think he does? He brings them back. It's not a trick question. When God says something, he's going to do it, and you can bank on it. But what happened is when they began to build the second temple... Again, remember the first temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed. When they return and they begin building it, they face various opposition. We see this in the book of Ezra primarily. And so what happened was the Lord used two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to do what? To stir the people up to finish the work. He doesn't rebuke them so much as he encourages them Because they have a lot of opposition and it seems impossible. Have you ever felt like there's something the Lord has asked you to do, whatever X is, and you look at it and you think, no way. It's absolutely impossible. And a lot of times it is from our standpoint. But if the Lord is with us and the Lord has purposed and he's called something, he's going to do it. In other words, what he orders, he pays for. That's the expression. So the Lord calls Haggai and Zechariah to get the people to finish the work. If you haven't been with us, essentially what you have in the first message is this. The Lord asked a rhetorical question. So the time hasn't come? (laughs) It's somewhat rhetorical. In other words, it's to basically say, you're busy building all of your elaborate houses. What do you mean there's not time for the Lord? You're busy doing your own things rather than focusing on the Lord. What was their problem? Well, he doesn't give them the honeydew list. How many of you men out here have ever received a honeydew list from your wives? The Lord doesn't do that first. He says to them, your priorities are wrong because I'm not first. You can do all you want to. You could go ahead and try to rebuild the temple. But if I'm not first, you're going to go back to that same perpetual cycle, which is you will fail. And so you need to make me first. And then you'll begin to receive the blessings that I have. And so he simply encourages them to rebuild it. And no matter what the opposition is, they can be assured it will finish the task. And one of the reasons was, I am with you. The Lord's presence was enough for them to get up and finish what he has asked them to do. You remember how they responded last week? Unlike many times of the prophetic writings... They respond positively, and they get back to work on the Lord's temple, which had been laying lax for somewhere around 15 or 16 years. Can you imagine us working on something around this church for whatever those reasons are, and for 15 or 16 years it lays dormant, and then all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord comes and the people get going? But invariably what happens is after not quite a month, it's about three to four weeks, the people get discouraged, and they're about to quit again. 
But the question is, why are they discouraged? I mean, the Lord's promised He will be with them and they will finish the work. Why are they discouraged? And that's what this second message is, is to encourage the people because what they do is they look back into the past and they say, wow, the glory of Solomon's temple is not what we're building here. It's far inferior and it's very insignificant. So why do we even bother? Now let's look here at verses 1 through 2 of chapter 2. And I told you that unlike some books in the Old Testament that give us sort of a general time period, these are specific to the day. Now someone asked me last week, this obviously isn't an American, if you will, calendar. Because if you notice, if you will, the seventh month, how could that be October? That's July. That's pool weather for us. Just think of it this way, if this helps. The Jewish calendar would have started typically around the March, early April period. If you have March, it's the third month. If you add seven to it, what is it? I did it on my calculator one more time to make sure I was right. Three and seven is ten, so that would be October. So that's just a simple math. But just remember, this is a Jewish reckoning, not, if you will, uh, the calendar that we use. But more importantly, why was this October the 17th? 520 B.C. so important. Why? Well, we know the first uh, message, if you will, occurred on August the 29th. About three some odd four weeks later, they get back to working. But then they become discouraged. Why would they become discouraged? Two things to note in particular, especially the second one. The first is this would have occurred during what we think of as the Feast of Tabernacles. This would have reminded them of various things. For example, his presence with them in the wilderness. You know, the Israelites spent 70 years in the wilderness because they did not take God at his word and do what he says. And so they spent 70 years, but of course the Lord was with them. But more importantly is the second one. Some of the people there would have known that this was the same time when Solomon dedicated what? the first temple. And we see that, for example, in 1 Kings 8, 2. Some equate this to somewhere around 440 years prior Solomon had dedicated the first temple. So the first temple would have been on their minds, some of them who lived that long, to see the exile and return. And so what do you think is the problem for those people? They're extremely discouraged because Solomon's temple was grandiose of all. If you get a chance sometime over the next few weeks, go back to 1 Kings, start reading around the time of David when he prepares all of the luxurious elements. They don't have this the second time around. The second temple is way insignificant from man's standpoint, but we'll see you later. And so this new temple pales that they're re rebuilding in comparison to Solomon's temple. And the people are discouraged, those that know what Solomon's temple was like. So as we begin looking at verses 3 through 5, this gets us to the crux of the message. The first two verses is easy to skip over, but you'll miss the thrust of it. And the thrust of it is there is a group of people that are discouraged because what they are building, it isn't so great in their point of view, from their perspective, obviously not from the Lord's. But what you'll see in verses 3 through 5 is, it says in verse 3, the Lord speaking through the prophet, he says, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? This is just a way of saying, who among you lived through the exile and knew what Solomon's temple looked like? We know, according to the book of Ezra, and I want you to turn with me here to Ezra chapter 3. If you brought your Bibles, turn there. So go left on the Old Testament highway. It's right after Second Chronicles, but before Nehemiah. And I want you to turn to Ezra chapter 3, and you'll see how all of these books are weaved together into what I call one beautiful painting, one motif. And we can sort of put the pieces together. Because essentially what you'll see here in Ezra is that the elders 
Those who lived through the exile and were able to return, when they see the temple completed, the second temple, they weep because they know what was before versus what they have now. But let's just read this real quick. It's Ezra chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. Now, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, this is the second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, the priests stood in their apparel with the trumpets and the Levites, And uh, let's fast forward here just a little bit, and we'll pick up in verse 11. They sang, praising, giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Very simple. The people see after they have returned from exile... They have begun building and the temple foundation is laid and they rejoice, right? Pretty straightforward. Except for verse 12. Yet or but is showing us something else is present there as well. Yet many of the priests and the Levites and the head of father's households, the old men who had, been, who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes. While many shouted for joy. What's the point? Look, what they knew was that the second temple was nowhere near as grandiose as Solomon's temple. They knew that the second temple was of the Lord, but it paled in comparison. Now, I would have to think if it was me and I had come through all of that, I would have had mixed emotions. I would have thought the Lord was with us. He rebuilt the temple. He has a purpose for us for the future. But man, we missed out because Solomon's temple was grand of all grandeur. If you don't know too much about Solomon's temple, I thought this might help because essentially the point is that Solomon's temple was vast, glorious, magisterial. And the second one from our advantage point wasn't. So there's a picture of it there. I found this out on Facebook. No, uh, it was too old to be that. So no, this is actually from Bible software. And you get just a glimpse of it. So no one was really present there to take this with their iPhones. This gives us an idea. But if you get confused with the temples, here's an easy way to remember it. They had a mobile temple, which we think of as the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was, of course, the place when they were mobile, right? When they get settled in the land, David is unable to build it for various reasons. It, meaning the temple, that was left for Solomon. And when Solomon built it, he based everything and everything was of grandeur. So notice here, it was twice the size of the tabernacle. It was built on great stones. These were these cedar beams that I mentioned to you earlier before. All of the boards were overlaid with gold. Can you imagine having that job? What did you do all week? Well, I was just laying gold over top of boards, and I did it one after the next, after the next. And when I finished, there was still a big old pile that I had to keep doing. Think of all the gold. But then look at this next one. This one is just, of course, a rough estimate. So don't come to me this week and say, well, I calculated it, and it was 19.2 million. Well, it's a rough estimate. I would actually say in today's terms with inflation, it's probably a lot higher, but uh, I'll leave that one alone. 20 million approximate of gold to simply cover the holy of holies. All I want you to see with these facts is, yeah, they're interesting and they're neat. And they show that Solomon spared no expense, nor did David. Because don't forget, David made a lot of preparatory work for this. They spared no expense. Do you know why? Because this was the presence of Almighty God among the people. And they were going to spare no expense. Whatever it took to give God glory, they were going to do it. Well, then they lost it all because of disobedience. But God was gracious. He brought the people back. And here is a glimpse of what the early second temples, a rubble's temple, looked like. Pretty nice. I couldn't build it. But do you see why they would weep? There is a mixture of joy with sorrow because they missed out 
And what, from their vantage point, what they were doing was insignificant uh, from their vantage point. And we'll see a twist on this later. Now, later on, someone has asked me, where does Herod's temple fall into this? It's easy to remember is this. Zerubbabel's temple is the second temple. When Herod came, do you know what Herod was? He was a builder. And when Herod built onto this second temple, that is the very temple that someone you know, very special, went to. Do you know who it was? Lord Jesus Christ, and they beheld His glory. They didn't know what they were doing. They had no idea all this vast amount of time. But in that time, what was missing? Well, here's a few things to consider. The Ark of the Covenant was not present. Indiana Jones had not found it yet. The Holy Fire. But probably the last one is the one that I think of. The glory of God was not present. The Shekinah glory has left, and it was not present when they returned back again. So the discouraged people needed a word of encouragement because many of them had seen this, but now this is what they see. So what does the Lord do? Well, let's pick up and go back if you were following along with me. What does the Lord do in verse 4? Three times, what does He say? He doesn't say, buckle up and get to work right away. What does He tell them to do? Take courage. Take courage. Take courage. Three times. Last week, I used the example of Joshua, so we won't repeat this again. If you ever want to be encouraged sometime, go look in a concordance, or you can actually Google this, and it'll do it pretty much for you. Type in, take courage, I am with you, and you will find an abundance of it in the Old Testament. And you know what also it does? It flows even into the New Testament. God wants to encourage His people that He is with them, and His V is with them. Nothing else really matters. Do you know if the Lord is with Decatur Bible Church, nothing else matters? And what I mean by that is all hell can be against us and we will prevail because the Lord is with us. It is the Lord's presence that is important. It's not Stephen. It's not anyone else. It's all the Lord in His presence with them. Now, why would Joshua need this? Of all the ones, why do I pick Joshua? Because if you think about it, Moses died and Joshua would definitely need it to be strengthened and encouraged because he would have seen himself as inadequate compared to Moses. Would you want to come behind Moses? I wouldn't. Shealtiel, that's fine. Zerubbabel, maybe. Moses, not a chance. I, I would not want to come behind Moses. And so what does the Lord tell Joshua to take courage? The success Joshua would have was simply because the Lord was with him as long as he remained obedient to his word. That was what would make Joshua successful. It wasn't himself. He didn't have anything within himself to be successful, and that's the same for you and I today. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. Unless the Lord helps us to do what we need to do here at Decatur Bible Church, I'll burst the bubble to you, you labor in vain. You might as well close up shop and just call it a week, because unless the Lord does it, Eventually, you know what happens to people? They don't have the strength to accomplish what God has given them to do because man is weak. That really strikes at our egos, especially in the United States, doesn't it? Because we like to buckle up our bootstraps and tidy on the belt and get to work. But unless the Lord builds the house and He provides, we labor in vain, and it's the same idea. But I want you to look at those two questions. Does it matter since the work seemingly is insignificant? Because I know sometimes even in today in modern ministry, people will say, well, only a few people came. There's only a few of us, so it doesn't really matter. The church today has become corrupt in many ways because we assume that unless it's some massive empire, the work is insignificant. But does the Bible teach that? Does the work that we do, no matter how small it seems, is it insignificant? And then the other one is, 
you realize, folks, that they don't have all of the resources that Solomon had at his disposal. How in the world are they ever going to finish this thing? So there is a prophet, and his name is Zechariah, and Zechariah answers these two questions because I want you to understand that this is a lesson for us today. Then I want you to turn with me to Zechariah chapter 4. I told you that Zechariah is a contemporary. When I say that, if you're confused by what I mean by that, is they both prophesied at the same time for all practical purposes. They prophesied to Zerubbabel and to the people, and the point was finish what God has called you to do. You'll never really understand what God's purpose was, but you still need to finish the work anyway. So I want us to try to answer the two questions, which is, does it matter if the work seems insignificant to us? It's a small work compared to Solomon's temple. And then how in the world are they ever going to finish it? Because they don't have the resources and all that they had, meaning Solomon. So let's look at Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And I'm going to go backwards. That's the way I work. I do everything backwards. But I want you to look with me first with answering the question, does it matter? And the answer to the question is in the question that is posed in verse 10 of Zechariah 4. He's prophesying at the same time about to Zerubbabel, and the question of prophecy is finish what God has called you to do. Zerubbabel naturally has in his mind, this is a small work, does it even matter? Notice what verse 10 says. For who has despised the day of small things? God's answer to that is, does it matter? And the answer is yes. Any work done for the Lord and His glory is never insignificant. And you say, well, how do you know that with this passage? Over 400 years later, after a period of prophetic silence, Herod will appear on the scene and Herod's going to expand this temple and the Lord Jesus Christ will appear in his glory there. That will be the temple in which ultimately, as is expanded, that the Lord Jesus will come. They won't see that. They won't know what is going to happen to that work. But the Lord has a purpose in it. So no work you ever do is insignificant, is it? No work is too small for us to do. But how are they going to finish the work? Because for all practical purposes, they don't have the resources. They don't have the money in the hands to finish it. Are they going to finish it of themselves or some other means? And now we're going to read Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. And if you're not familiar with this, this is a prophetic vision. And the prophetic vision is basically telling how is Zerubbabel's temple, the second temple, going to be fulfilled or finished. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you will become a plain And he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. If you don't understand what he's saying here, essentially what he's saying is Zerubbabel won't finish this nor the people by their own power and strength. J. Vernon McGee calls it brains and brawn. You ever heard he's the old Bible teacher from another day? He says they won't rebuild it based on their own brain power and bronze. Now I'll remind you that kind of sticks doesn't a little bit at our egos. Because a lot of times in ministry, I see this all the time today, we assume that we have finished and complete God's work in our own strength and our own power. What does verse 6 say? How does the Lord finish His work? By the work of the Spirit of God. God's Spirit empowers and enables God's people to do what they otherwise could not do on their own and in their own strength. You realize this is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says that he was weak, but by the power of Christ he could fulfill anything that God had called him to do. It is the power of the Holy Spirit working in a group of people that God enables them to do what they can't do on their own. If you like a memory verse, use this one. 
This memory verse blows our egos away, though, because we like to think of it this way, don't we? Lord, we're going to finish the work that you have for us at Decatur Bible Church, and if we happen to need you, we'll ring you up through prayer. It doesn't work that way, folks. If you want Decatur Bible Church to do well and to do the impossible, you're going to have to depend on his strength, his power. You have to let him do the leading, and then we have to follow behind him. And then there's nothing that can get in the way. Because the work of God is done through the Holy Spirit. It's not done through Stephen. Uh, You know about how long I would last? A few weeks. And you'd have to throw in the towel and get another pastor. And you'd be in this perpetual cycle. So let me just remind you that the Lord does His work through the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have to be yielded to Him. We can't finish the work that He has to us in our own brains and brawn, can we? I'm going to read this to you. It just sums it up well. The rebuilding of the temple would be accomplished not by human strength or resources, but by the power of God's Spirit. In other words, what he's saying is, notice, the temple will be restored not by the strength or ingenuity of Zerubbabel, but by the power and provision of God. The Holy Spirit is what empowers us to do what we cannot do otherwise If we as a church yield ourselves to the power, direction of God through the Spirit, nothing is too impossible for God. Now, if we try it on our own, we'll be throwing in the towel long before we ever get anything done. And all they have to do is notice the past example back in the passage and then we'll move on. The answer to the question, of course, or the example that was given of course, is Exodus. And uh, if you turn back to Haggai, you'll see where he says that in verse 5, As for the promise which I made you, meaning the people, the nation of Israel, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding. That means to remain in your midst. Don't be afraid. The nation of Israel getting out of Egypt alone was an absolute miracle because they should have never gotten out. How did they get out? Did they get out of their own strength? Did they get out because of the great brilliance of Moses? Not a chance. They got out by the power of the Spirit of God, and God got and gets all the glory. That's why people always go back to the Exodus, because they should have never gotten out of Egypt to begin with. And so one of the things you and I do, if you get discouraged, look back at the past... Look where God has been faithful there, and He will be faithful again in the future. He just calls on us to be what? Obedient, faithful, and those sorts of things. If we look at the past and we think, well, look at a great job I did, you'll miss the point. God is faithful to Decatur Bible Church for how long? Actually, you just saw it a few months ago. What, in 85 years? I mean, that's the Lord, no offense, not you and I. But then let's move on here because back in the passage here in verses 6 through 9, he gives them hope for the future. Because he's giving them a promise that one day, just as God shook Egypt, which is a small nation, meaning in totality compared to what we're going to look at, he's going to do this again in the far distance, but to all nations. So in other words, as he did to Egypt... He's going to do to the totality of the world one day. Look in the passage with me, and I know sometimes this passage can be a little confusing, so let me try to break it up into parts. First, verse 7 makes the reference, and so does verse 6, to this idea of the shaking of the nations. Now, this morning, in the passage that I read from Hebrews... It makes that same reference, doesn't it? It's referencing in the future. It speaks of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a kingdom that can't be shaken. Anytime that this reference or this phrase is used, it just simply means judgment. God is going to bring judgment just like he did to Egypt. To whom? The nations. And we know that. We, we have seen this before. Uh, If you want the reference to shaking of things, meaning judgment, look at Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 9, for example. You can see in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 26 says that this ultimate fulfillment, though, is still future. 
One day, very simply put, what is being described here is God's going to judge all the nations of all this creation one day. We've already seen this, haven't we? At the second coming of Jesus in the book of Daniel. Now, I didn't use the same statute. You remember this one from Daniel? What happens at the, with the statute in Daniel chapter 2? Well, in the right time in human history, the smiting stone, the Messiah, will come. And what does he do? He destroys, he topples over that, temp, uh, that statute. And that's what's being described here. One day at the second coming of Jesus, Jesus is going to judge all nations and they'll be in subjection to him. Do you not look forward to that day? I do. I look forward to that day when his name will be one and the only one. And so this idea is he's looking to the future and saying, don't forget, you right now are under Gentile dominion. This is the time of the Gentiles. One day the Lord Jesus Christ will return, the Messiah, and he will judge all the nations. We see that Daniel chapter 2, Matthew 24, Revelation 19, 15. But what about this other piece here? What's this latter glory? Do you notice in verse 7 there is the reference that they, the nations, will come with wealth? Some translations translate the Hebrew, Hebrew as desire. Uh, probably both are true because in the millennium, the nations will bring, of course, the wealth of the nations to the millennial kingdom, the temple and so forth. Uh, but they will also, of course, have a desire for him. But you'll notice here, how could it be that the future temple will eclipse Solomon's? There's two ways to understand this, and I'll give you both. Basically, if you think about it, when Jesus came, the glory of the risen, or the glory of Jesus Christ, of course, came, didn't it, to that second temple? So you have Solomon's temple, which was greater from man's standpoint, was destroyed. And then we have Zerubbabel's temple where Herod expanded to it and then the Lord Jesus appeared in his glory. I think that that's true yet, but we also need to remember one thing, which is the millennial temple will be filled with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to read that, it's in what we would say is Ezekiel 40 through 48. So if you're ever curious about the millennial temple and the descriptions of the glory that will be there, read Ezekiel 40 through 48. If you're not familiar with it, get a commentary to help you along because when you talk about details of that temple, it is quite grandiose. I still see this as future because if you notice, it speaks of peace. Peace will come to this place. That means the temple or Jerusalem. When Jesus came, he did bring peace. It would be what I think of as vertical peace. You and I, when we trust in Jesus, what do we have? We have peace by the blood of his cross. But we also need to remember that the millennium is a time of peace and righteousness on the earth. Is the earth right now, let me ask you to answer this question yourself, is the earth now in peace and in righteousness under subjection of a peaceful, righteous ruler? If you're honest with yourself, you can't answer yes. That is still future. That is the time in Isaiah 66, verse 12, that the earth will be flooded with peace and righteousness. Don't you look forward to that day? Do you know, as Christians, we have hope for the future, and the hope is not in an earthly kingdom, but it's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that day, do you know whose name will be? One, the Lord's. That'll be the only name. It'll be the supreme preeminence of all names and all nations will be in subjection to him. Our hope is in the future of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ here on this earth, not in any man-centered kingdom. And there will finally be peace on this earth. So you'll have vertical peace, of course, but then you'll have horizontal peace where the nations are not fighting anymore. So what would be the exhortation from this? It's easy to get discouraged when we serve the Lord sometimes, isn't it? But no work you ever do is insignificant if you do it for the right reasons and for His glory. Nothing. There is no such thing as too small of a work for the Lord. But we need to learn to take courage knowing who is it that ultimately gives us the ability to do what we otherwise couldn't. It's the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit, if we will yield to it at this church, the Lord can do many mighty things that we cannot do on our own. I don't know about you, but as I serve you here, I certainly can't serve you in my own strength very long. But if we serve in the power of the Lord, there's nothing too impossible for him, is it? Are you trying to serve on your, in your own power? Let me invite you today to give up, because you can't do it on your own. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for today, a time in Sunday school, a time to sing your praises, Lord, and a time of prayer, and Lord, to also hear from your word. Lord, your word speaks to us from the beginning of its revelation in Genesis to the book of Revelation. But Lord, as we see here today, the individuals would have been discouraged from because from their vantage point, the work that they were doing would have seemed insignificant. But obviously, they had no idea what you had planned in the future. And Lord, it was far beyond anything they could imagine. Lord, it's even further than what we can imagine. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ reigning on this earth in righteousness in the millennial temple. Certainly no eye can imagine what that will be like. Father, I do pray, though, that as we saw in Zechariah, Lord, that we would not try to serve you in our own strength, but rather, as the prophet says, not by might nor by power, not by our own brawn or brains would we try to serve you, but simply let the Spirit of God work in us, and then, Lord, anything is, of course, possible for you. Lord, I pray each one of us goes out into this world as we leave this week, whether we come back tonight or not, encouraged that you are with us and you'll be with us to the end. And Lord, I pray we share this hope with the very dark world that we live in. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and God's people say, Amen. As we close the service out in song.